A radio live show near Lady Bird Lake in Austin is the start of an evening late one September. We begin with the scene several meters wide in the gallery of the Harry Ransom Center. Now every minute we will look at some of the largest and smallest items across the UT collections and our field of understanding will become wider. My name is Aaron Pratt. I'm the Carl and Lily Forsheimer Curator of Early Books and Manuscripts at the Harry Ransom Center. We have over one million books, um, five million photographs. We have all kinds of things that really document the entire range of human creativity and expression. One of the largest objects at the Harry Ransom Center is right behind me. Um, it's a map from 1648 made by the Dutch cartographer, publisher, Renaissance man, Johan Blau. It's nearly seven foot by 10 foot in size. It appears to be the largest or one of the largest maps that Europeans made through the 17th and 18th centuries. The Harry Ransom Center has lots of miniature books, and I almost selected one of those for this occasion. But one of the small things that I'm really interested in that I think is very distinct from the map is a small lead hornbook. A hornbook was a wooden object, kind of paddle that had the alphabet on it that was used for children to learn how to read. This is a cast lead version of one of those hornbooks. It's about two and a quarter inches tall by an inch and a half maybe wide. And we think that these were used as children's toys, um, that, a, that a, you know, a young child would use it with their doll to play school. So the Blau map is, was made in 1648. The Little Lead Hornbook, we think, was made around the 1670s or so, so you know, roughly around the same period in time. They speak to very different aspects of early modern life, right? The map is really all about trade, negotiations of state, war, politics. And while the Hornbook is involved in teaching the literacy that makes one able to participate in matters of state. It's something that's interested far more in family life in a domestic setting. And I like that comparison where on the one hand you've got big map, matters of state, world domination, that kind of thing. And on the other you have really what day-to-day -day life was like in early modern Europe. I'm Carter Foster and I'm Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs here at the Blanton Museum of Art. It's the city of Austin and the University of Texas's Art Museum. We're the main art museum for both and we're the only collecting art collecting institution in the city. We are um, well known for our Latin American modern and contemporary collection as well as our international and American modern and contemporary collection. We also have about 17,000 works on paper, one of which you'll see. Miss Fortune is a very small print by Sebald Bayham, a German artist working in Nuremberg in the 16th century. Sebald Bayham was known as one of the little masters because they created these very small works, which is quite a feat of technique if you consider that an engraving is made by digging out a line on a copper plate with a burin, so it's not very easy work. And if you're dealing with a very small surface area, and in this case it's about three inches by two inches, so it's quite small, we're talking about a, you know, a really incredible mastery of a technique of engraving. The iconography, it's funny, it's sort of related to stacked waters in that it's got a lobster in it because lobsters were thought to walk forward and backward so they represent a kind of chaos. Stacked waters, it's by a Miami-based artist named Teresita Fernandez who deals a lot with materiality and perception. The title Stacked Waters references the famous artist Donald Judd who did famously these types of work he called stacks. It's also meant to give the sort of the, the feeling that you're in down at the bottom of a pool with the water getting lighter as you get closer towards the surface. The work is 3,100 square feet in surface area. So it takes up that large surface area of the atrium in this building. My name is Lisa Boucher, and I'm the director and curator of the Nonvertebrate Paleontology Lab here at the Jackson School of Geosciences. Some of our uh, largest specimens include ammonites. Ammonites were generally marine organisms related to modern day squid, octopus, and uh, nautiloids. Their heyday was in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Our collection includes microfossils, which as the name implies, are microscopics. Among the smallest are the foraminifera. They primarily were marine organisms. Foraminifera existed from the Cambrian time, so 500 million years ago, and actually they occur today as well. The smallest are going to be less than 30 micrometers. Our collection is really interesting because it includes a 
wide array of types of specimens. Not only size ranges, but also what they are. You know, what's great about them is that they all are useful in many different ways. Ammonites, as well as Foraminifera, these are used as what we call index fossils and can be used to help date different time intervals in the sediment. My name is Kathleen Brady Stimpert and I am Deputy Director of Landmarks. Landmarks has about 50 works in the collection. They are modern and contemporary objects. It includes primarily three-dimensional sculptural objects, but also some digital works and some painting as well. We are here in the AT&T Conference Center, which is home to Jose Parla's magnificent mural titled Amistad America. It is 25 feet tall, 162 feet long, so it's about 4,000 square feet. Although the size of Parla's mural here is extraordinary, we do in fact have a larger work in Landmark's collection, and that is a sculpture on Speedway by an artist named Nancy Rubens, and it is titled Monochrome for Austin. It is composed of 70 aluminum canoes, and they are fashioned to a stainless steel armature that rises 50 feet in the air. Below that, there is an armature that goes down into the ground nearly 40 feet where it is actually anchored into the bedrock. Although most people think perhaps of just the sheer size of the works in Landmark's collection, which is significant, I think perhaps of greater significance is the impact that they have the works really serve to create place for students and it becomes part of their routine. They get to see them in different seasons. As they walk to class, they develop relationships with these works. As a single portion of the painting fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding of the University of Texas collections. Our journey has taken us through the 40 acres. In addition to these, there are still many clusters of other large and small items across the UT collections. 